All right, everybody, welcome again uh, to another exciting edition here of, of Logic Live. This is session number four for us. Uh, we're going to do Nuke for Flame Artists with Christoph Zaplatal from Hamburg. I want to thank Christoph for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, Christoph is a freelancer working, like I said, in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, I'm sure many of you uh, recognize his name. He's been a great contributor to the Logic community. And uh, he also has uh, done quite a few uh, FX PhD sessions. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody about uh, Logic.tv, our new website, where you can find all the recordings of Logic TV episodes, or Logic Live episodes, as well as uh, a bunch of tips and tricks, and uh, just a great place to, to find anything and everything Flame-related. Also, another reminder about Logic Fest. Uh, I've gotten a bunch of submissions for Logic Fest, which is our little tips and tricks contest. So I want to thank everybody who's contributed and let you know it's not too late to, uh, to contribute as well. If you've got something that you want to submit, it's really easy. You go to oneframeofwhite.com or logic.tv to sign up. You then uh, email me your tip or trick uh, to uh, or technique to nyflameusergroup at gmail.com by uh, midnight on Sunday, April 19th, which is next Sunday. And then uh, we're going to give everybody on Logic an opportunity to vote for their favorites and announce uh, some winners. The five entries that get the most votes will each receive a one-year license of Sapphire and Mocha, courtesy of our friends at Boris FX. We're going to announce the winners during the uh, Autodesk Up Close and Personal with Flame uh, event. It's an online event on Tuesday, April 28th from 1 to 3 p.m. There's a registration link here. You can find it on the events uh, page on uh, logic.tv. And uh, please definitely sign up for that. It's going to be great. Uh, our friend, Will Harris, who's the Flame Family Product Manager, is going to show off a bunch of the things. I think they were going to show at NAB for the, you know, what's, what's new and exciting in Flame. And then we'll follow that up with uh, the Logic Fest winners. Like I said, our friend uh, Christoph, he's very active on, on Logic and you may have seen or uh, signed up for one of his uh, excellent FX PhD courses. The beauty ones are fantastic. I would highly recommend them. Actually, I just do want to give a shout out also to our friends at FX PhD. Um, these guys, I'm sure everyone knows them. If not, they're the best training available anywhere. There's like 250 courses uh, covering everything in, in production and post-production. And um, they're running a, a promotion right now, 25% off on new memberships. So please go to fxphd.com, check out what they have. And, uh, and I want to thank them. They've always been uh, huge supporters of Logic and the user group community. So thanks to the, the folks over at fxphd.com. Uh, and so without any further delay, I'm going to hand this off to Christoph, who's going to take us through uh, and show us Nuke for Flame Artists. Hello, Christoph. Um, love that charts. Great. Um, yeah, the idea of today's session is basically to bring all of those of you guys who either never touched Nuke or, well, touched it once and burnt their fingers a little bit or never really got around to it, into it because with the introduction of, of pattern browsing and, and the um, um, shot publish, Nuke is really in my opinion, a great sidecar for Flame. If, if you do a bunch of stuff in Flame, you can uh, really get one or two things really neatly done in Flame, uh, in Yuga in as well. And um, so I structure this in, in three parts. So the first part will be just a basic introduction into the interface, really just get everybody up to speed where everything is so that they can follow along. And then I'll quickly take you back into Flame and show you a shot that we all basically have done time and again. It's really day-to-day -day work, nothing too fancy, but I, I will uh, step you through that very quickly and then we'll re rebuild that shot in Nuke just to give you an idea how easy that can be to get you started in Nuke. And after that, um, I would like to, to hand you into a quick guide into how to read the artist script. The idea being that you're in at your facility at 10 p.m. in the evening and all the new guys have left building and the clients, this one more change. And yeah, you can do it in flame in two to three hours fixing up that. Or you could open up that new script and really quickly check where, where to find this certain met or something. So I won't present you with a huge script, but rather 
I'll just give you little hints what to uh, watch out for to, to help your way around. And the last part will be my, um, let's say my favorite mm -hmm. features in you, why I think it's such a great companion piece to Flame and why I pretty, the tools that I pretty regularly use. So let's start off with the interface. This, what you're seeing is the latest release, Nuke 12.1. And this is the vanilla layout. Nothing uh, is, is modified here. This is really like out of the box, what it looks like on a single screen workstation. So uh, the main part obviously being the viewer up here. So you've got um, sliders here for your exposure and your gamma. So you can uh, basically fulfill the same function what you would do in Flame with uh, Control Shift one, two, three, and so forth to gamma up and down your picture. You've got uh, a bunch of drop-down menus here on the side, and this is where all your nodes are located. And basically, for newbies, this is the perfect place to to actually get a grasp of the the whole tool set of Nuke because. For example, if you uh, open up the, the transform menu here, you get all the transform nodes from a simple 2D transform to up uh, to a grid warp or um, corner pinning and all these things. Likewise, for color correction, you'll find them here. Everything from a simple color correction to OCIO or match grade or you name it. So this is the first uh, way you can get nodes into your node graph. So you'll just select one and Boom, it pops up here. The second way you can get notes into your node graph is by doing a right click. Sorry, that was a little bit too fast. Right click. And then you basically get the same menus as on the top left hand side. And you can navigate those and pick your notes. Once you're a little bit more fluent in the uh, Nuke lingo, you might check out this. If you tap and you know you're, for example, looking for a hue correct. You just type in the first two, three letters, and then you can pick that from the drop down menu. Once you get used to that, that's a pretty fast way of working. And last but not least, like every software, this one has got shortcuts. So the most common nodes you'll use, like transform is mapped to a T, or a grade node is mapped to a G, merge to an M. So that's how you can populate your node graph which is the one we see down here. Uh, if you want to put any of these views into full, um, full screen view, you just hit space. So there you go. And space to get back. And that works for the node graph as well. And on the right hand side here, we've got our proper panel. So basically, if I double click on any node, the properties will show up here. Big difference to flame is you can um, populate these with multiple nodes. So I can put up two or three nodes or up to 10 nodes in that thing, copy values around. It's something to get used to. It can get a little bit crowded. I usually keep mine to a maximum of two different nodes up here if I don't need any more. But um, that's one of the differences you, you might want to get used to. Um, one thing I should mention is also the viewer inputs. Uh, which is basically uh, what you know from Flame as context views. So if you select any clip or node and you hit one, you put that into the viewer. If you select another one and so, uh, hit two on the keyboard, put that in the viewer, and then you can switch between those. And this works with every uh, numerical button up to, the, uh, to zero. And that's your context views. And other than in Flame, you haven't got any more different views. The only exception being tab to switch between 2D and 3D space in the viewer. All right. Of course, this interface has got much more. So you've got a curve editor, you can put up uh, scopes, uh, all that stuff, but that would uh, totally uh, explode the contents of this evening. So I think this is enough to get everybody, even the ones who never uh, had, had a look at Nuke, uh, started to follow along. So let's switch to Flame really quickly. And I'll take you through this little shot. This is from a tutorial from a couple of years back. 
and um, it's it's like the the normal thing you do your online and after the shoot the client decides yeah we changed our packaging we want to add a logo on that side as i said in the intro nothing too fancy but something each and every one of us has to do on a regular basis so let's go into the batch and the way i tackled this is i did a pre-stabilize here using the perspective grid so like that this it's in there quite snugly. We take a look at the result view. So I got rid of my perspective. And then I loaded it in the logo, resized it, repositioned it to taste, did a little bit of color correction on it uh, to, to um, put it in with the original print, little blur on it to, to kiss it in. And then I did a pre-comp here just for myself to see if it fits. And then actually here, I did an invert on that perspective grid, put out a mat and comped that back on top of the original and that's it. So really nothing too fancy as I said, but I think for somebody who, who hasn't yet built a comp from scratch and you maybe the easiest way and also something that fits our time format. So how do we go about this in Nuke? Well, Let's switch back. And the first thing we need is a fresh script. So we'll select new comp. And there we go. So that's a clean, clean slate for us. And the first thing we need to get in is our material. So for that, we need a read node, which will access our file system, get the files in there. And I'll use the shortcut R to read that in and navigate to that folder, Logic Live, Rushes, Shot 110, and there we go. So you've got your little preview viewer down here if you want to, and you can open that. And now on the right-hand side here, our read node populates the properties bin, and we can see, okay, this is a different format than uh, actually the MP empty viewer we see up here. And this is something we have to set up if we are not hooked into a big pipeline where a tool like Shotgun or something takes care of this for us. We have to do this ourselves. We have to adjust our settings. So in the, uh, in the node uh, graph, we hit S for the project settings. And there we can adjust things like, for example, this resolution. So now we make sure that like in Flame, everything we create from scratch, like a, a, a color source or a checkerboard or a, a resize is, um, is created in, in the appropriate resolution. Okay, hey, so we've got that done. Quick yeah. question for you. When uh, you, sure. can, can you only keep one uh, script open at a time or can you have like two different shots open in two different windows or something well, like that? Actually, I still got my, my little intro um, set up open here. And also the one I'm still coming to. And that's actually quite neat because one thing that allows that to do pretty much like you can do with batch groups in Flame is that you can grab a single node or even an entire backdrop like this one. So backdrop is new lingo for, for um, compass. Compass, thank you, Andy. Yes, sir. And um, so you can you can use your normal um, Apple uh, uh, Command C and um, Command V to paste that in here. So that works quite nicely. And um, I had sessions running where I copied between uh, six, seven different open scripts. What you don't want to do is um, put multiple shots into the same script. I've seen some people do that at the beginning, but Nuke is really made for one uh, shot in, a, in, in one script. So you wanna do multiple scripts. All right, um, moving on. Um, safety first, I would like to save this script away. And um, this is where, where we see a difference to, to a tool like Flame or Flare. Uh, where all this management gets taken care of for us. Uh, here we have to take a little bit more care ourselves. So uh, we have to define a place to save this. So save comp as, and I'll navigate that to the appropriate folder again, nuke, 
and I'll save this as max SR uh, SH 110 and then I'll add a version number and my initials dot nk that's the the nuke file format and save that away the neat thing is like with iterations if i for example do a new comp version nuke will um, recognize that version number i did uh, v001 and automatically increment that and increment that so now i've got version two already but um yeah so our script is saved away now we can finally get to the fun stuff and we'll start that by doing a planar track. So I'm using this tab thing here because it's much faster for me than looking those up here. And I'll pick the planar tracker, which actually is a rotor shape. So like in flame, the, the planar tracker is uh, tucked away in the, in the rotor tools. And putting that into an input viewer, um, I'll draw a quick shape like we do a little bit larger than the actual area to give it all the nice detail on the edges like that, like that. And now if you want to track it, you don't use the player controls down here. You use those ones up here, then you'll actually perform a track. Oops, sorry, I forgot something. I have to switch this to input because otherwise he would have tried to track all the stuff before frame 1001. So that was my mistake, sorry for that. We've all done it, don't worry. So now progress bar appears and he does a pretty fast planar track on that. And so now, oops, I have to move that. So now um, you can see here we've got a bunch of, of tabs up here and we're interested in the tra tracking tab and there we can do a little correction and I'll do that on the first frame. And um, some of you guys might know the trans keys function in the old G-mask or in, in some parts of action, something I really like where you can offset entire animations. Well, uh, Nuke has the same thing, the, the ripple up here. So now you see, if I move this point to offset, the entire animation will offset. And like, oops, grab the wrong handle. There we go. There we go. And there we go. So now it should be in place. Let me check. Looks pretty good. Okay. So now right out of the planar tracker, we can create ourselves a, a corner pin. As we don't have such an uber node like, like action where, where we can correlate so much stuff, each and every function in Nuke is its own node. So um, we'll create that. And you see those linked with a green arrow. And like in badge, the green arrow indicates a connection, in this case, an expression. So we know that if we do any changes to the planar track up here, that will propagate down to my corner pin. So there we go. And there, I want to set this up uh, like a pre-stabilized. So the first thing we do is we set this to the input format. And now it looks like any four-point track we would do with a bilinear in action. But we want the exact opposite. We want the, the corners of that box exploded out to the edge of the screen. So for that, we'll just the invert. And now we've got our perspective gone. Hopefully the track is pretty neat. I think for our purposes, this is good. Yeah, a little bit wobbly, but I think it will manage for now. And um, now it's time to bring in our logo. So once again, I'll hit the read and um, bring in that other image as a read node it's up here. And in Flame, we would use a comp node. And in Nuke, we use a merge node. And there are two important differences to the comp node in Flame. And the first one is 
this one has two inputs as well. We've got the front and the back and flame, and you, we've got A and B. Well, what the merge node can do, but what can also be quite confusing, it can accept uh, different resolutions as compared to comp. So uh, which one um, defines the, the output resolution? Well, that's always the B input. So that's why we connect that first. And also in the tidy script, you will always see the B input coming in from above. So in flame, you would always build your flow graph from the left to the right. In Nuke, you always build it from the top to the bottom down. So that way we know, okay, this is the resolution trickling down here. So we connect this in from the side. The second big distinction is this uh, merge node supports multiple channels. So we don't need a different meta input. We've got one, but we don't really need one as our logo comes equipped with an alpha. Um, this gets pro uh, pulled right in here and applied here as well. So now you see my pre-stabilize is, is the master resolution 2K DCP and my logo gets added on top. And now hitting T, I get myself a transform node and I can move that handle by hitting command, bring it down to the very bottom and bring this over here. And um, I'm using the arrow keys now to scale this down. And what's really neat about this is if you use left and right to move your uh, cursor, you can um, move, the, move the decimal. And by that, you can really uh, finely tune this without having to resort to the slider, which you can use as well. But if you want to really finely um, massage in a value, this, this can be really, really helpful, uh, allowing you to take a look at the picture instead of the numbers. Christoph, I'm keeping my mic muted because I've already went, oh man, like 15 <laughs> times. Just like the, the B input controlling the resolution was just like something that I had been looking for. I felt like it would have been it's, easier to find the, the meaning of life. I, I know this is not the, the most uh, uh, exciting of comps, but I wanted to find an example where, where it's more this daily life stuff that, that we trip about because oh, totally. we could have dove into 64 EXR channels and everybody would go, huh? Yeah, and right. everybody uh, would go, how do I, where, how do I move up? A, a so I thought, pixel. and I hope this is not too boring for, for anybody, but I, I thought let's, let's start it with day to day stuff. And once you got that managed, you can get into all the other exciting stuff. This is great. Thanks, man. Cool. Great. So we've got that. Now we need to color correct this a little bit. So I'll just tidy this up a little bit. And if you wonder, um, for, for inserting these little elbows, um, I'll just hit command again. I'm, I'm on a Mac here, so on a PC it would be control or on Linux. So um, one thing I want to do is, um, like I would inflame with a, with a color correct match uh, function, I want to match these black values. So I use a grade node, bring that in here, and use that color picker and really just sample that area so now this is defined as the black point um, and now i can pick that from the corner pin from the pre -stabilize. and now these two should match but now we see we've got a little bit of an of a pre-multiply issue this this is now too bright well this is where i show that Basically, every function in Nuke has got its own node. So you can do a pre-mult as its separate node. So usually, my, my Nuke comps tend to have three to four times more nodes than my average Flame comp because Flame nodes tend to be a little bit more complex. So this, this is also hidden away in other nodes, but um, Nuke, well, leads you to using a lot of nodes. Let's, let me just put it that way. So now we've got that pre-multiply issue fixed. Okay, now we can pull up a color correct, hitting C on the keyboard. Okay, great. Let's bring down the saturation a little bit. And going into the midtones, I want to adjust the gamma. Bring that down, 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 down. 
And if I want to, to, um, to, to have a little bit more control, there's this color wheel on the side. So for each of these values, I can pop them open and then I get a much more defined interface uh, on where to put my, my colors. So now I can try to blend this in a little bit more. Probably something like that. So, but now I need to fix this, um, this uh, envelope a little bit more because this is a little bit darker down there and probably a little bit greener as well. So in Flame, I would use the color warper and use the selective and be done with it. Um, I can't do it that simply in Uke, at least not with the tools that I like. So the way I do it here is um, taking a look at my channels. So in the viewer, if I hit R, G, and B, it's the same as in Flame with Shift, R, G, B, I can see the separate channels. So taking a look at the green channel, I can see that I can pretty easily use this to color correct the envelope itself. And if I wanted to do this in Flame, I would get a separate node and just pull out the green channel and treat that separately. Well, for that in Uke, I'll use the shuffle node, which is this one. And I'll just pull that green channel and put it into every output. So now green goes into red, green, blue, and the alpha, which means now if I take a look at the alpha hitting A in the viewer, this is just the luminance values and I want to grade those. So I'll pull up another grade. This is something in Flame I would probably use a 2D histogram. So up here, I can change which channels I actually want to grade. So I want to grade the alpha and I can just crunch a black, value, uh, black level and bring down the whites. Just to be on the safe side, I'll add a clamp on that. So now I've got myself a nice mat for that envelope. So adding another color correction, I can put that in here. And on the side, these guys have these little additional inputs and this is a mask input. So now I can hook that up in here and switching to my merge so that I see it in context. I can now start to maybe offset this a little bit until it roughly hits that color. So now let's say I'm happy with that. Now I want to add that back onto the original picture. Now I could go and just copy this, um, this corner pin and uh, redo the inversion uh, I did on that. That would be perfectly fine. However, I want to make you quickly aware of one thing that can really make your Nuke experience really, really slow and uh, sticky. And this is this bounding box. Um, Nuke literally knows no boundaries. So um, when I did that, that corner pin, that pre-stabilize, it didn't just kill off all the pixels outside of the uh, viewable area. It just put them into this 8K or 7K plate. And um, so if I would copy this node and just paste it here like that and invert that, uh, that pre-stabilization, Magically, all my information is there, but if I, if I try to play this back, that gets really, really sticky. Well, the more elegant solution would be to instead break this out here, just grab the positioned and color corrected logo, get another merge node, comp that on the background, like that. And if I play that back now, it's much faster. And also I'm avoiding the whole upsampling, downsampling issue uh, that I would have with the, um, with the other way. So I, I just wanted to illustrate that this bounding box is there. And um, just one quick thing, just to, to make the point more obvious. 
if I use a cropped node, I can get rid of that. So just insert that here. And now you see the bounding box is gone. However, if I now copy that node and um, reintroduce it here and do the same thing to invert the stabilization, then only that area will be there because all the rest has been killed off. So what's missing, obviously a little bit of defocus. This is much too sharp. So just hitting B for blur. And don't get intimidated by me using all those shortcuts. This is just muscle memory. You'll find so much more stuff if you, if you just browse through these notes. And um, so I'll dial this up, bring this to something more appropriate, maybe like that. So, and, and for argument's sake and in the sake of time, let's, let's say that this would be a good comp. And um, now we need to get this stuff out here. And uh, in, in Flame, we would just pull out a, um, uh, a render node and the stuff would land on my desktop and I wouldn't have to worry about it. Well, things are a little bit different here. We need to specify a file path. And uh, there are one or two caveats with the right node that you just need to be aware of for the first time and then you, you just know it. And that is hitting W for the right node connecting it here where I want to render it out. And like in Flame, I could place this anywhere in my script. Um, so by default, I'll just get rendered R, G, and B. But I could, if I, for example, want to use this in Flame with a mat, I could add, add also an alpha channel here. And um, there's no file type specified yet. We'll do that when we actually enter the path where this should land. So. I'm going to navigate to my renders folder, nuke, and I'll just create a new folder here because we want to keep this nice and tidy. Max SH 110 version 002, my initials. I'll just copy that along and create that folder. And in that folder, I'll paste that in. And now, you need to define uh, the suffix so that, that we can keep that frame sequence. Because that's a mistake that when I was starting with you, I constantly make, I just put my file name in there, wrote .tiff or .exr, and I got um, the same file overwritten again and again, and then error message. So you need to define with hashtags how many digits your suffix should be. So I'll usually go with six, so I'll add six hashtags dot exr i want to render exrs and now once i've done that all the ex options um are are given to me here so i can modify this render it full float if i like and um, be happy with that um just for i uh, or or for completion's sake if you're working in a big pipeline this might be taken over by shotgun and or or another tool and just uh, be set up for you. Okay, so that be my simple mundane tracking shot uh, rebuild in Nuke. And now, if there are any questions, uh, hit me up. Otherwise, I would continue to the let's navigate in somebody else's script part. Hey, Christoph, I had uh, one question for you. Um, yeah, sure. When you were inserting nodes into, like in between two other nodes, was there yeah. a hotkey you had to hold down in order to make that connection? No, no. You, so for example, so let's just insert anything here. I'll, I'll pick a, um, a grade with a G and I'll just hover over this and then the line gets highlighted and I drop it and then it's in there. Also, if a node is selected, and I hit G, it gets inserted downstream. So that's something that can be quite handy. So for, um, if you for nodes yeah. that for for that that type of thing where a node gets inputted or inserted and connected automatically, in the case of like a, a merge node, is it automatically connected to B? Yeah. Okay. I I I, I suppose uh, I think so. Yeah. Let's check. No, actually, it's 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 using the A input. Okay. 
Um, I, I usually avoid that. I, I want to make my own connections, actually. And how do so, you change that? Uh, yeah, like, that's how, would why, you, um, how would you change that connection now? Uh, there's, a, there's a nifty shortcut that shift X, uh, X, shift X. Oh, so hello. that way you can shift that around. And that works for, for a lot of nodes with two inputs. For, for example, you've got a, a key mix node or a dissolve node, and, and they all work with the shift X. And one more, what if you wanted to ex extract a node? Like if you wanted to pull out the... the, Ooh, the that you now you got me because I'm, I'm lazy and I always do uh, <laughs> command, Z, command, uh, command C, command V, copy, paste. Uh, I know there is one. So oh, uh, uh, maybe you know, somebody J in the chat JT, knows. Yeah, JT in the chat just put in a, a command shift X or control shift X. Command, control shift X. No, command shift X on a Mac. Yeah. Oh, okay. Command yeah, shift X go. on a Mac, control shift X on Linux and PC. There you go. Thank you very much. So Thank you, JT. Oh, and thank you, Yuri, also. Cool. All right. Great. Does anybody have any other questions? This is great so far, Christoph. Thank you. Cool. Glad you enjoyed. Right. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. Okay, great. So navigation. So first one, very quickly, we won't go through each and every node. I, I know you guys have probably other stuff to do tonight. So I just wanted to quickly highlight that um, there are certain node families and that you can quickly visually identify which they belong to. So for example, every 2D node is a square one. So now those are also color coded. So for example, all the transform nodes are, are um, this lilac tone, color corrections are generally blue. Channel shuffling is, is this dark red. 3D nodes on the other hand, so once we enter 3D space, we've got these round ones and usually um, if you're looking, for example, for, for a 3D camera track, it's pretty obvious that those are those big round circles. So that's something, if you're sitting in front of a big script, this is what you're looking for. And then I don't want to go either into particles or into deep compositing. I just wanted to show there is a certain logic behind all of this. So the, the, um, the particle nodes are having this, this combination of squared and round and the deep nodes all use this, this arrow-like um, formula to indicate okay. themselves. That's great to know. Thanks, man. Cool. But um, there's a little bit more to see in the flow graph. So I'll make this full screen for now, just so that we all see a little bit more. So I mentioned the, the arrow connection. If you're in a script, which has got uh, loads of, of uh, expressions or trackings linked or whatever, and these get a little bit too crowded, you can disable the, um, just the view, not the connection itself, by hitting Alt-E. So then you've you got a, probably a cleaner view. And Alt-E again to bring those green arrows back. And um, on the node itself, it's indicated if there is animation present. So that's the big red A on the top right corner. That indicates that an animation is present. And for example, if we go back into that view and select that node and head to the curve editor, we can make that animation visible. On the other hand, on the lower right corner, if you see this green E, it means that this node is linked to an expression. So in essence, this has also got animation, but that animation is derived by an expression. So you just get the E. And um, one more thing I want to highlight here while we're at it, back into full screen, is um, the nodes also tell you um, the, the channels that are present. So we can see this has got red, green, blue. So just RGB, there is no alpha present. But the corner pin already has got RGBA, but nothing else. This one gets an input with RGB, but just processes the alpha. So that's why these squares are a little bit smaller than the big one here. And uh, while we are speaking of channels, I know this is the part where each and every one burned his fingers, uh, those EXR with 64 channels, and we don't know what is what. Well, 
this is your best friend. If you get, get a CGI rendering on Flame, we can always go Shift C and we see all the passes that are there and we can pipe them out and use them in batch and that's really neat. Well, if we import an EXR into, into Nuke, we just get that. And, um, and the 3D guy tells you, oh yeah, I, I put you an ambient occlusion and, and a normals pass and a world position pass all in there. And you, you're sitting in front of there and going, well, I've got R, G, B, and A. Oh, and one more icon that tells you that there are actually more channels. Well, as I said, your best friend is the layer contact sheet. What that does, it's a normal node. So if you want a new one, you just hit up tab, layer contact, get that there. And what that does, just gives you an RGB representation of all the channels present Ooh. in that EXR. So now you know what you're, what you're having, what you're dealing with. And um, so how do you get them out of there? So let's just say you want uh, the direct irradiance. You want to, to pipe that out. You, wanna, you just want to render it out into flame or you just want to treat it or, or do whatever with it. You need that channel. What do you do? Well, you get yourself this shuffle node. And the best way, especially if the naming is a little bit off, like in our example here, the best way to do this is pull up your layer contact chip in the viewer. And then you go into the shuffle node. And then take a good look. OK, it's the direct irradiance, this one. And boom. There you got it as a channel. And honestly, at least from my experience, a good portion of the Nuke artists um, sets it up this way that they pipe out all the channels with a bunch of shuffle nodes and then do their shader rebuild in a, in a visual uh, way in the RGBA world. You can do it differently, but I think this is actually quite nice and very close to the way we would tackle this in Flame. So that's it, what I've got for navigating scripts. And um, if there are any questions, uh, hit me up. Otherwise, I would hand, uh, continue to camera point clouds and UV unwrapping. Sorry, Christoph, quick, quick question for you yeah. on the property Please. panel. Um, is there a way to either to, to define like that you only want two nodes shown in there? Because um, in the past, whenever I've double clicked on a new node, it shows up yeah. over there. But then, like you said, you end up with 10. Yeah, uh, I should have mentioned that. I've got this max panels number up here. So by default, this is up to 10. And then this happens, like you said. Oops. Oh, yes. Yeah. Get, you get the idea and I put up one more and one more and you have to scroll down. Well, I usually keep this to two. Why two and not one? Well, for example, if I want to copy tracking data or, or uh, do, an ex, uh, do a link, then it's handy to have two up there. But two usually is where I don't have to scroll and, and uh, get lost. So that's, that's great. That's, that's cool. great. Um, for your, uh, the shuffle property, no, the shuffle node that you had uh, up there a second yeah. ago to uh, pick which one of the passes you wanted out of that multi-channel yeah. EXR. Can yeah. you set that up to do more than one or would you need Yeah. To... Okay. Like more than yeah. one, the um, same shuffle it, node or do you need a shuffle node for each pass? You actually, um, you need a shuffle node for each pass. They, okay. I think the foundry is thinking if this could be opened up to multiple outputs it's 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 with a question mark mm -hmm. there are they, they want to hear what people think about that but right now if you want to do a shader rebuild you would actually have to do five or six shuffle nodes gotcha. and uh, you would probably go okay this is my direct irradiance and then you will put up the next one and the beauty and so forth and so forth until you've got your shader rebuilt done. Well, I think that I just being found my said, first, um, I found, I, sorry, I just found my first no nuke Python project. 
and that's going to be to get uh, the label there to automatically list the the uh, channel that you've got picked from the EHR. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, nice. Great. Okay. okay. Um, Anybody have any other questions before we move on? No, I think we're good. Cool. Where we go. All right. So as I said in the introduction, I, I like to, to use Nuke as my kind of side card occasionally from Flame. Also, um, I've worked on quite a few jobs, either as a Flame artist or Nuke artist, um, where, where Flame was the main tool and we had to hand off cleanup stuff to Nuke. And I just wanted to show something which I find really, really helpful. Um, and that's, um, we've got a camera track here and this one has been done in Nuke, but normally I would, uh, I would do it in, in Synthize or somebody like Inti and his awesome presentation from last week would do it in PF track. So it really doesn't matter which camera this is from. But what I really, really dig, I have to say, is this point cloud generator. Um, so now we, we know the normal point cloud we get from each and every um, object, uh, each and every camera track, which looks like something like that. And this is also, yeah, that's a normal point cloud, but it really doesn't tell you that much about the scene because it only visualizes the points that you actually tracked. The point cloud generator analyzes the picture and the solved camera and tracks additional points and gener generates a much, much denser point cloud, which looks like that. So that, oh, I should have shown the footage first. That's, sorry. So let's take a look at the footage first. So that's basically just, just a normal handheld camera going around there. Uh, now it's running in real time. Cool. So that's what we tracked. And this is the camera for that. And this is the point cloud generator for that. So let's pull down up both. Where's my camera? There. Okay. So now you get a proper visualization, 3D visualization that scene. So that could help all kinds of stuff. You could use that for relighting or, or for properly locating something in that scene. But what's also really neat, and Inti showed us last week awesome stuff we did with, with projecting on extended by cubics. Well, what you can do here is you can um, actually select a part of that um, that group or that point cloud and I'll just roughly select this corner here and bake those points into a mesh. So now you've got a rough geo you can project on and for, for a lot of set extension stuff or little removals this is really a fast way and you've got some tools to modify this and you can actually take it further with the model builder and all that. But it's, it's pretty neat for cleanup work that you can easily generate yourself some geo. So that's nice. That is the other cool. thing you can, um, the other thing that you can do of course is accurately position stuff with point cloud. So what I did and I prepped this because uh, you don't want to see me pushing 3D around for 10 minutes. I put a cylinder where, where that uh, mailbox is. And I just projected the footage onto that. So this is the footage coming in. This is a projector. So you can, you can imagine this like, like a diffuse map in flame being fed by the, by the whole camera. So this is not like a, uh, a frozen camera or a locked frame. This is the, the moving camera projecting onto that, uh, that cylinder. And then, and this is neat, you can do an uh, UV unwrap of that texture. So that way 
you can do all kinds of stuff on that, even on things that are not just a card or a ground plane. So for example, what I did very roughly is to paint that out. Uh, the, the little uh, tagline there. So if we take a look at the original material. So just take a look out for this. So that turns around while the camera pans along. Well, that was basically three clone brushes on that unwrapped texture and it was gone the whole time. But I thought we should have a little fun with that as well. So I added something to that unwrap. And I'm just showing you the unwrapped texture. And mind you, this does not get reprojected. Instead, I copy the cylinder and uh, texture it with that directly. And the result of that, and I pre-rendered that as well because it just, uh, I've got a little iMac here and this would really kill it. So little slab comp, but I thought it shows the, the potential quite nicely of what we can do with that. That's great. So everybody thinks with 3D tracking of, of big set extensions or matte paintings. And I really think if you've got a good 3D track, you can do so much nice cleanup really fast and efficiently. And um, so, yeah. And honestly, the, the, you want to do your comp in Flame and who doesn't, the point cloud generator can be a great tool to just gen generate yourself some quick uh, geo to project on, export that at, as an FBX, get it into Flame, hook up the same camera, camera you used in, in Uke for the point cloud generator and you're, you're good to go. Oh, somebody just asked that question. That's perfect. Cool. Um, so... Is, yeah. uh, is that something you could, uh, you could show or uh, at least how you export this stuff as an FBX, even if we don't pop yeah. over the flame? Uh, I haven't done it in a long time, so bear with me. But well, so okay. let's We're generate live. that mesh. What could possibly yeah. go wrong? What, what in the world? <laughs> so we've got our mesh and we have got a right geo node. So with that, we can, it's, it's like the right node, but it'll write a geometry. So we'll select a location for that. Let's get this logic live, put it in application data, and let's name this mesh.fbx. X and all right, let's see. And this should be the range. So I'll head over to Flame. Living on the edge, my friend. Oh, it'll work. It'll work. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so let's That's see. That's my favorite. So it'll work. It'll work. I hope. So let's see, import. I have to move zoom here a little bit. So let's head to that. No, that's wrong. Sorry. Always great projects. Logic. Application data. Nuke. There's the mesh. So there's a geo. So I would need the camera now. Let's see if we can get that one over as well. I don't, I hope. Can we do that? Because normally I would have tracked and synthesized, then it wouldn't have been a problem. But this right. one I tracked in Nuke, so I don't know if I can write the camera out. No, no, he won't let me do that. I don't seem able to export the camera right now. Um, 
Yuri is saying you need a scene node. A scene node. Let's try that. And I'll write you. Let's see. So Here we go. Let's see. And we would go with an FBX as well. So and I'll for good measure, I'll put in the mesh as well. So let's see. Mesh cam dot FBX. Execute. All right, back into flame. All right, so let's put that up as the cam. Whoa. And I'll get, I'll get that footage. Thank you, Yuri. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. So I'll quickly do it dirty like that. Where is the mailbox? Where did I put the mailbox? Oh, uh, wait. Sorry, I got that from somewhere else. Where's that? So bear with me a minute here. I'll but we want to see if this worked properly. Sure. So oh, okay. Two two six five one point two. Got it. Else, look. So let's change that color space as well. It's better. Yeah, there you go. That's great. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So they do play together after all. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, what great. I've got prepped for to today. So uh, I hope somebody found this useful. And um, if you've got any questions, hit me up either here or, or on Logic, and I'll try to answer them. I'll pass you on to Yuri. This has been great. Um, actually, I had a question for you, Christoph. Sure. Could you go, uh, go back to, to Nuke for a second? Sure. Could we just, I just want you to, if you, if you wouldn't mind, just take me through the flow graph. Um, I'm so used to seeing everything one. going from left to right, but uh, yeah, like from uh, basically everything in red, like where you went from camera track because certain things went to the right and then your projection yeah. went back to the left. All right. So my main stream would be this one, mm -hmm. basically. So this is more like playground area, you could call it, where you set up stuff. And I'll, I'll delete this because this wasn't originally there and not really integrated. So... This is the camera, and so there we, there's this. Mm -hmm. This is the undistorted image. So normal image, undistortion, goes into the camera tracker, creates a camera, resides here, and then um, our image goes into a project 3D. And that is fed into a cylinder or projected onto a cylinder. I gotcha. should say it that way. So this is what happens there. So now we are in 3D space. We need to get back. So that's what we need the scanline renderer for. So if you pull that up, normally this would need at least 
an object or a scene. So we feed in the cylinder and a camera to create a picture. Mm -hmm. However, on this one, we change the projection mode from render camera to UV. So we ren render the UVs. And this doesn't need a camera. So that's why we get this picture. Mm -hmm. So that's the UVs of that cylinder. And that basically now we are back in 2D land and um, can apply a rotor paint, which painted away the, the uh, little graffiti up there. And then I just did a little color correction and transform and blur, basically the same stuff I did on, on that mailing box mm -hmm. uh, in the first part of the presentation and uh, added that to our uh, neat Logic Life logo, put that there. And um, the shuffle basically is there to supply the whole thing with a white alpha. Gotcha. And then it gets fed back in without a project 3D or anything, just as a plain texture. So this cylinder, this one is a copy of this one. It needs to be in the identical position. These need to be exactly the same, otherwise it won't work. Mm -hmm. so. Cool. And then down here, this gets just a reformat to make sure it's in the say uh, in the uh, in the correct uh, resolution into a scanline renderer. It gets fed the camera, and um, the result looks like that. And I merged that on top of the original footage. And normally I would have needed to redistort this image. I forgot that. And then it fed into the right node. And that's basically all that was to that. That's great. Wonderful. One, there was one question from the chat for you and that was the undistortion. Was that automatic or did you have to input lens info? Um, well, as I said, this is, uh, this is footage that was from an original course, I think from Victor Perez, great new course. And um, he supplied, wait, let me take a look, uh, a lens grid. Oh, okay, good. So a slate actually with, with uh, film bag and, uh, and the lens grid. So all the stuff we never get in real life. <laughs> <laughs> At least that we can agree. So, yeah, true enough. Awesome. So yeah, that's how the lens uh, undistortion was done. Pretty easy with a grid. That's great. <laughs> Sad but true, as Yuri said. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Anybody have any other questions for Christoph? All right. Well, Christoph, thank you very much. And of course, you can always uh, hit him up, like you said, at, over at Logic, if you do have any questions. Um, Christoph, thank you so much. I it was really a appreciate great pleasure. It our upcoming Logic Live sessions. Uh, we have a little bit of a schedule change uh, with everybody working from home. Uh, we thought it would be good to have a little, a little tech talk. So uh, next week, Sunday, April 19th, we're gonna have a Logic Tech Talk with Jack Harks and Alan Terry. The guys have some uh, things that they wanna show in terms of like best practices and uh, some ways you can configure things at home. But if you are working at home, if there's some technical things that you keep running into and you have some questions, uh, and you'd like to hear them discussed, obviously you can do them in the chat, but if you want to send them to me ahead of time, just email them to logicthefx at gmail.com. And we thank um, Jack and Alan for that. That's going to be followed on Sunday the 26th by CG Compositing in Flame and Color Management with our friend John Ashby. And then I'll do the Python scripts for Flame on Sunday, May 3rd. And we have a bunch of other things also in the pipeline for later in May, and I'm looking forward to telling you about those. A reminder for Logic Fest, you got one more week to get your tips and tricks and techniques in there. So please submit those uh, over at logic.tv or oneframeofwhite.com. And uh, this will be up on logic.tv uh, as soon as I can possibly get it up there. Um, if you guys could do me a favor and uh, when the videos are up, uh, if you could subscribe to the, the YouTube channel, that would be wonderful. We'll try to get uh, as many subscribers to that as we can. And that's going to do it for Logic Live this week. So thank you very much again, Christoph. Thanks to our friends at Autodesk for, uh, for the tech support with the Zoom meeting here. And everybody have a wonderful and safe week. We'll see you online.